at a respect for those who have come on time and for those of us who have things going on after this. Um, let's get rolling. So we're we are um, really pleased to to um, host um, Susan and the Zero Waste Committee of the Sierra Club um, to to get us going on a um, really learning about about this and and I have to admit that I know nothing. I know zero. So this is good. <laughs> um, and uh, with Kathy Sharon, most of you know, president of RDC League for another couple months. Um, and just to um, tell you some things that are coming up, um, we, as I already mentioned, the Quilts for DC exhibit, which is at the ARC on 1901 Mississippi Avenue Southeast. Um, the quilts are gorgeous, just gorgeous. And there's something very wonderful about standing in that gallery, being surrounded by these gorgeous pieces, all celebrating um, our quest for, for DC statehood um, made by, um, well, we got 60 quilts, not every, mm, several people submitted more. So we'll say um, several dozen makers um, from 15 states. Um, they're really gorgeous and worth the schlep over um, to see them. Um, they are there at 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday. So they're, even if you're working full time, there should be some time to get out there. Um, and then they will be in December at the helm for a couple of days for a few hours on the 7th and 8th from 4 to 6. And then on the 9th of December from five to eight, and you will all be shortly getting your invitation to our holiday thank you event. And um, the quilts will be there and their, our fundraising auction will be up and running by then too. So it's a really good chance to see the quilts in person. So you know which ones you're gonna bid on. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm gutting for a couple, but, you know, I'm willing to let you overbid me, uh, but there'll be some competition on a few of them. So, and the and the proceeds will um, support our um, work in the coming year. It will be our, our source of operating funds. So if you want us to keep going um, and, and doing the work we're doing, um, reaching out to voters, um, getting registration that goes on all the time, and certainly our work with Restore the Vote, reaching our, our voters who are incarcerated um, around the country, all of our statehood work, um, and, uh, you know, watching um, the council and seeing what's going to happen, who's going to head what committee and what legislation is going to come up? How is that going to affect everything? Whatever we do to keep our office running and, and just keep operating, um, we need to, to raise some, some money. And this is our big opportunity. Um, so I am uh, really happy to be able to introduce Paula Hershoff, who um, initiated this and she has been our climate watch gal for quite a while. I've been sending her uh, the periodic emails I'm getting from the League of Women Voters US team who are in Egypt at, um, uh, at the uh, COP27 event. Um, I think they've been fabulous. I don't know. <laughs> their, their insights have been super. Um, it's fun, fun to read. Um, and the work they're doing, is, it's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm really proud that the League of Women Voters US and therefore we all have a seat at that table and um, are taking our role as UN observers and participating in this um, climate group really seriously. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that we too in DC have had this on our radar and will continue to learn. So Paula, I leave it to you to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the climate team wants to thank you for being here tonight on the 21st anniversary 
of America Recycles Day. And really, it's America Recycles Day. We had no idea about that when we scheduled this meeting. So it was quite a coincidence. Um, so we're here to discuss the Zero Waste DC plan, which will address climate justice issues as well as the threat from greenhouse gas emissions. And um, here to help us understand what's going on is climate activist, Susan Shore, who chairs the Zero Waste Committee of the Sierra Club DC chapter. She also leads the club's national single use plastic sub team of grassroots volunteers. And she works with the National Reuse Network, which promotes reusable foodware and packaging as a solution to plastic pollution. And she participates regularly in webinars and other online exchanges like this, I think. Um, Susan joined the Sierra Club DC chapter four years ago when she retired from the UN in Geneva, Switzerland and moved back to DC. Shortly before retiring, she was eating lunch at her desk one day when she looked down at the plastic takeout containers strewn about on her desk and realized things had to change. She switched to reusable foodware and vowed to devote her retirement to fighting plastic. Well, her interests have now expanded to all things zero waste with a focus on policy and legislation. She testifies regularly for the Sierra Club at DC oversight and budget hearings. Susan lived in DC from 1984 to 1992, earning her JD from Georgetown University Law Center in 1987 before spending 26 years abroad. She'll speak for maybe 20, 30 minutes and then take, but she's gonna take audience questions as she goes along. Um, and, um, your climate team, myself and Judy Smith, invited the DC Department of Public Works to also speak at this meeting, but they were too busy with America Recycles Day. They invited us to send written questions, so we did. And Judy and I will let you know what the responses have been after Susan speaks. So I'm turning it over now to Susan Shore. Well, thank you so much, Paula, for that very, very warm welcome. I really appreciate it. And I wanted to thank you and Judy Smith for inviting the Sierra Club DC chapter to talk about um, the Zero Waste DC plan. Um, and as you said, it's kind of coincidental that today is America Recycles Day. Um, I have to admit, I also wasn't aware that there was an America Recycles Day. So it's a surprise to all of us. Um, so I'm I'm going to, you know, try to share as much as I can without um, boring you about what's going on with the zero waste DC plan, but I'm happy if something that I'm saying, you, you know, causes you to have a question or you don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, if I slip into zero waste jargon, just um, please, you know, feel free to interrupt and ask questions or make comments at any time. That's that's fine by me. And I'm I actually have questions for you from time to time as well. So the more interactive, the better. So, um, so let's get started. Um, what, what, what Judy and um, Paula asked me to talk about is the development of the Zero Waste DC plan, what it is, why it matters, what are some of the Sierra Club's concerns about it, and what also is Sierra Club, what are the actions related to zero waste? Um, so I'll, I'll try to, to cover all of those points. Um, let's get started. So. The Sustainable Solid Waste Management Amendment Act of 2014 um, called for an interagency waste reduction working group to develop a zero waste plan. So that was back in 2014. And the plan was supposed to outline the steps the district can take to achieve at least an 80% waste diversion rate. That's because also in 2014, DC set a goal to divert 80% of its waste. And that means not sending your waste to land, landfills or an incinerator. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we need 
um, a zero waste plan. It's called for in legislation dating back to 2014. But having diverting our waste from landfill and incineration will also have a positive climate impact. And I'm gonna quote from a recent report that says, and I quote, better waste management is a climate change solution staring us in the face. <clears throat> Excuse me. It doesn't require flashy or expensive new technology. Zero waste strategies rapidly and cheaply bring down emissions while building climate resilience, creating jobs and promoting thriving local economies. That's from that report. In addition, here in the district, zero waste is an environmental justice issue, especially for the residents of wards five, seven, and eight, as I will explain later. So maybe we should back up a little bit and address what is zero waste? So let me show you the zero waste hierarchy, and maybe that will help explain if like Kathy, um, you're, you're not knowledgeable on this topic. Um, and I have to admit, when I started my advocacy with the Sierra Club, I had a lot to learn as well. So it, it can be learned. So as you can see in this um, hierarchy, it prioritizes principles like reducing waste by not buying so much stuff, reusing items that we already have, composting food scraps, yard waste, and other so-called organics, and recycling. And maybe you've seen t-shirts like mine, my Sierra Club t-shirt that talks about reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, so those are some of the, the key principles. But this zero waste hierarchy, as you'll notice, starts with rethink and redesign. And that's to promote the transformation of our current linear take, make, and waste model into what's called a circular economy approach, where producers of products are responsible for the full life cycle of their product. Here's an example. Have you ever bought a bottle of milk, a glass bottle of milk, where you had to pay a deposit on it. They sell these bottles of milk in my local Safeway um, and at Whole Foods. So you pay a deposit when you take it out of the store um, and you get that deposit back when you return the empty. The dairy selling the milk cleans and sanitizes your um, returned bottle refills it after they've sanitized it um, with fresh milk and sells the product in the same container repeatedly. So that's that I hope gives you a quick overview of what we mean by zero waste principles, but happy to stop here if anybody has any questions. Um, and maybe I can rely on you, Paula or Judy to let me know if there's a question. You're, you're muted, Paula. For some reason, I don't have the full um, uh, uh, grid up in front of me. I only see six people. Okay. So, all right. Um, show I, all. Oh, I see. I see. Maybe show all. No, that doesn't work. Okay. I don't see that anybody has a, a hand up or anything like that. So again, if anybody you know has a question as we go along, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and just shout out. And, I'm happy to take the questions. And they could also put it in, in the chat. They could also put it in the chat. That's right. Judy, um, can you see uh, the full um, lineup of everybody, all 15 people? I, I think I can now because I've just hit on the grid, you know, the gallery. Yeah, I can. All right. Maybe you could be in charge of doing that because I can't see everyone. If anybody has, they have to put their little hand signal up or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just let me know if, if okay. you, and you know, feel like I said, just feel free to unmute and, and then, you know, interrupt me at any time. Okay, so the district's goal is to divert, to divert 80% of our waste by 2032, which is just 10 years from now. So how are we doing? Um, and I know this is one of the questions that the League of Women Voters asked DPW as well. Um, so DPW, uh, DPW, which is the Department of Public Works, and I'll use that acronym a lot, DPW, Department of Public Works, 
they're legally required to issue yearly waste diversion reports, but the latest one dates from calendar year 2018. So the latest information we have from 2018 gives DC a citywide waste diversion rate of 16.11%. So we're not, we're not very far along. Um, we're doing slightly better in the residential, um, for residential customers there, we've achieved just slightly over 25%. But we are clearly very far from our goal um, and we would have to divert 64% more of our waste citywide to achieve that goal. And Paul, Can I ask a question here? Sure. This um, was one of the questions that we were going to ask Sarah um, as a follow-up. Um, what do we mean by 16%? Is that 16% of everything in both our green and our blue um, bins? Or is it 16% of um, just what's in the green bins? or um, what is 16%? Percent of what? So I think it means of the overall um, waste that we're collecting citywide, only 16% of it does not go to a landfill or incinerator. The rest of it is all going to a landfill or incinerator. So that's, I think that's including what's in your recycling bin. So I just have to say something here, Susan. That means that the way everyone carefully separates their plastic from their garbage or their, you know, cardboard, that's really useless. That it doesn't do any good because it's all going, mostly going to the. No, it doesn't. Well, it it depends. It's um, it's not you know black and white. Um, there are there are markets. There are di different kinds of materials have more or less successful recycling markets. So um, like metal cans are very, have a very successful um, market. Mm -hmm. um, paper and cardboard, as long as it's not contaminated, um, mm -hmm. also has a pretty good recycling market. The plastic market, the problem with plastic is that so much of it is being produced, there's not a big enough market for all of it, plus a lot of the plastic when it is recycled emits toxic chemicals and cannot be, um, even if you take something that was designed as food packaging, it can't be reused as food packaging because it will emit harmful toxic chemicals in the recycling process. So I hope that that responds to, to some of those concerns. Do you know, uh, Susan, what percentage of what goes into our blue bins is recyclable? Well, anything that goes into the blue bin should be recyclable, but I think what you're asking, what percentage of it is recycled, <laughs> right? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but probably uh, if we took a deeper look at the waste characterization study that, that DC did, we might be able to find the answers, but that, those would be good questions for you to ask. Yeah, um, I, did. <laughs> I, I mean, what I, what I will say, and I was gonna say it later, but like for plastic, the projection for next year for residential customers is only 7% of the plastic will get recycled. So that's really, on America Recycles Day, that's a very low number. If we are, if we pay very good attention to the little triangle on the bottom of every plastic container and make sure not to sell, uh, to put sixes in there, does that help? That does help. I mean, part of the problem is contamination. Um, then, the, and a lot of people engage in wish cycling. They put things in the recycling bin that they, they hope will get recycled, yeah. but, but they don't. And sometimes those things can contaminate a whole, um, you know, um, collection of recycling. Or if people, for example, some people insist on putting their recycling in those thin plastic film bags that you get at the grocery store. And that immediately um, means everything in that bag will be rejected. Oh, because those bags clog up the sorting equipment. All right. This, you know that my whole complex, I just moved to this condo complex and 
they I see them do that. They put we just we dump it all loose and then they put it in big plastic bags. Yeah. I mean, all that extra work here and then it doesn't do any good. Exactly. So, yeah, that's a problem. If they dump it out of that big plastic bag um, someplace, and that's what a lot of people, a lot of the, you know, um, stores and restaurants and and the Y and every place else, they say, well, we dump it out of this big plastic bag. We have to have a liner, a plastic liner in our container, but then we dump it out. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's clearly a lot of education that is needed about what can and cannot be recycled and how to recycle it. But let me continue sure, um, sorry. with what I no, it's fine. It's good. I'm glad that we have this. So in addition to this uh, sustainable solid waste management act, which set the 80 percent waste diversion goal. Um, D.C. Council has also passed the zero waste omnibus amendment act and. Um, this law, that, that was a law in 2020, so it's pretty recently, and it set up a number of requirements, some on DPW, Department of Public Works, and others on DOEE, the Department of Energy and the Environment. And the measures that um, were put on DPW are all about source separation. So what, what is source separation? That means that instead of all of our waste going into one bin, we separate out certain waste streams so that they can then be re reused, reduced, um, composted, or recycled. So you just have to separate things. And so I'm going to talk a lot about source separation, and that's what I, I, I mean by that. So. DPW was supposed to start collecting, having source separation for the collection of glass. So that was going to promote better glass recycling um, in the district. They were supposed to train this year janitorial staff about source separation. They were supposed to develop a comprehensive organics plan on composting. And then starting on January 1st, 2023, like, what is that, six weeks from now, <laughs> um, they were uh, supposed to uh, reach out to large retail um, stores, grocery stores, and universities to let them know that they are required to begin composting as of January 1st, 2023. And so far, none of that has happened. Okay, which is which is very frustrating. So does DC have a zero waste plan? The bad news is not yet. The good news is that after years of waiting, DPW has finally launched a process to develop a zero waste DC plan this year. And let me see if I can move my slide. Um, on this slide, I've put links um, if you want to find out more um, about this plan. So there's a link to where you can find um, more information about the process of this plan. So where do we stand? Um, DPW has begun organizing a series of community engagement programs, which started in August and will run through December 30th of this year. And I'm going to, and they also have this survey. I put the link on the, for the survey, but you can find that survey on their zero waste DC plan. Um, here's their public engagement timeline. Um, for whatever reason, they, this is the latest, you know, I just, I just took this off of their website. Um, it used to have the initial um, community engagement session round one, which ran from August 1st through August 12th, for whatever reason, they've taken that off of there. Um, did any of you participate in any of those sessions? There were sessions August 1st through August 12th, and then more recently, August 17th through 28th. Um, I'd love to know, you know, what, 
what your uh, feedback is about any of those sessions, if you attended them. I, I attended one of them and um, I was, they were listening to, uh, there were only three or four participants, that is residents, and they listened carefully to what people said, but to me, it sort of seemed like reinventing the wheel. In other words, it was, I don't know what that noise is. Um, I think somebody may be unmuted. I think there's somebody who's oh. called, called in and yeah. I don't know whether, I don't know who that is, but if they want to- They just to... muted, they just muted themselves. Okay, oh, great. Oh, unmuted. Sorry, it's me. I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear me and I didn't know I had background noise. Is it really bad? Um, yeah, it is. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll mute again. Okay. But feel free to jump in anytime you want to ask a question or, or make a comment. So you felt like they were just going over. Well, they were, I mean, like the residents were saying things like, well, why don't we follow the San Francisco plan that, you know, they seem to be very successful and, you know, they were pushing that and the person, the representative of DPW was saying, oh, well, that's a nice idea. Maybe we should, you know, and it was, it struck me as very odd. Okay, well, for those, it sounds like most people didn't attend. So um, just to bring you up to speed, DPW held one session for each of our eight wards um, in the district. Plus it had one session for business, the business community and one session uh, that was not open to the public that was for government stakeholders. And then they repeated that again in October and the sessions were run by DPW's really highly qualified zero waste consultants. And those consultants explained, I mean, these are really like national experts. Some of them are my Sierra Club colleagues um, from California, um, but they, they also you know, do have a zero waste consulting businesses. And they explained that, th that DPW's goal was to build a zero waste plan based on residents' input. And I'm gonna bring that up in a little bit um, again. The August round was fairly general um, and tried to seek residents' ideas on what should be included in a zero waste plan. Although each, um, each ward's meeting also had a specific theme. And this is not a very high quality um, picture in this slide, but this is literally a screenshot that a Sierra Club volunteer took during the very first session. Because up until that point in time, we had no idea that each ward, uh, each ward's meeting was also going to have a theme. And this, was, this had never been explained until um, we got into the very first session. So this, you know, if you're interested, these are some of the, the themes. Then after the initial, um, the community engagement events, DPW uh, published a draft zero waste DC framework on August 24th, when then it opened up a period of um, public uh, comments, written comments. And then once the written comment time period closed on October 7th, DPW took down that draft framework that they, <laughs> that they had shared with everybody um, at the meetings, um, but you can still access it as a um, Excel spreadsheet. And on, on, slide, this, on this slide, um, I've given you the link to get to their page. If you're interested in seeing what is in the draft framework, you have to scroll all the way to the bottom and there's a lot of scrolling. So scroll, scroll, scroll till you get down to the bottom and then here, between these two red lines, which you will not find on your screen. I put them there so you can see what I was pointing at. Um, that's where you can find the draft framework. I don't know what they're going to do tomorrow. Tomorrow, the written comment um, period opens up. They may have a new draft of the framework based on the second round of um, community engagement meetings, or it may be the same thing. Um, so I'm not. it's not clear to me what people will be asked to comment on. So, 
excuse me, um, could I ask you a question about who is um, the contractor for the zero waste um, plan? And when did our DC government um, hire them? Um, at what amount of money and for how long? I, I don't know the answers to all those questions. I do know that there was a request for proposal um, to hire the consultant. So there was a competitive bidding process and the team that was selected is called Ruth Abbey Associ and Associates. Okay. Um, and as I said, um, Ruth Abbey is really a leading zero waste expert um, in the country. Most of the people on her team come from California, which is really, you know, highly regarded as a zero waste leader. So um, we're very pleased with the quality of um, the consultants that DPW selected. I don't know the details about how much they're getting paid or, or how long their contract uh, runs for, but apparently the contract is supposed to be a public document. I tried to find out and I couldn't find it any place on their website, but I'm sure that if somebody, you know, somebody who knows more about where to find those things could probably dig it out. Right. Okay. So that's kind of um, the process um, that has happened. And then, as I've said, tomorrow, the second and final round of written comments opens up. Um, and if you want to provide written comments, um, you know, starting tomorrow through December 30th would be the time to do that. Um, and then after, after December 30th, then what DPW um, has said in all of these meetings is that they and their consultants are going to develop the zero waste DC plan. So right now we just have a framework, like a skeleton. And that should be, we hope, fleshed out. Um, and then it's supposed to be published in the spring of 2023. So <clears throat> does anybody have any other questions about the process? I'm gonna talk about what's, what's in it um, and what we'd like to see included in it. But if you have any questions about the process so far, happy to take those. Okay, so what is likely to be included in the plan? And I'm gonna share just my personal view. This is not a Sierra Club view. This is my personal view, um, is that the current framework, it goes really big on goals, but I'm concerned that the implementation of it will be far more limited. Um, the draft framework includes very well-tested zero waste practices and measures. And these include things like save as you throw, which is when um, people are charged less if they send less waste for landfilling and incineration. Like you shouldn't get charged for sending things for recycling or composting. It would only then be what goes into your green bin. And depending on how much you have, the price, the price that you pay would, would vary. It includes increased adoption of reusable foodware. It calls for the repair and reuse of appliances and other household items. Much more widespread composting than DPW offers today, as well as outreach education and enforcement. So these things are, are great. Um, we're really happy to see those things be included. But why am I concerned about implementation? for a couple of reasons. First, it's taken us over seven years to get to this point. DPW could have developed a zero waste plan years ago. The mandate started in 2014, okay? So it has taken a really long time. And then on November 7th, um, interim DPW director, Michael Carter, testified at a waste diversion roundtable that was convened by council member Mary Che. I also testified at that roundtable and I also listened. And he explained in his testimony that DPW could only begin developing the plan once they completed the 2021 waste characterization study, which provided baseline 
data to formulate policies, he said. But wait, didn't DPW say in, in all of these community outreach sessions where they had the nation's leading zero waste experts that they wanted to build the plan based on residents' input? So I don't understand why they needed all this data um, and to, de to develop their policies. Second, um, Mr. Carter testified about some of DPW's plans. They include a, the compost pilot that they plan to launch in the spring. You may or may not have heard about this, but for residential customers um, of DPW, that is people who live in residential buildings of three or, or fewer units, there is going to be a pilot to test curbside compost collection. So he announced that DPW would likely announce the sign up before the end of the year. So again, that's like six weeks from now. Um, and I think um, people would receive a postcard about that. So if you are a residential customer and you're interested, look out um, for that, that postcard. Um, he explained that 12,000 households would participate across the district, 1,500 per ward in order to have an equitable pilot, which makes a lot of sense. And DPW wants to run the pilot for a year. They've been given some funding to do the pilot um, in the fiscal year 23 budget, which was started being operational on October 1st, but they're going to have to get more budget in the fiscal year 24 um, budget in order to run it for a full year. So <clears throat> if the curbside compost pickup pilot runs from the spring of 2023, which is when they say they're gonna launch it. So they're gonna notify people that they can sign up we hope before the end of the year, but you won't actually be able to, to have curbside compost if you get into it um, until the spring 2023. So they start it in the spring of 2023 and run it until the spring of 2024. Um, the earliest that they might be able to expand it so it becomes a regular service would be sometime later in 2024. So again, things are Slow. Yes, that's right, Judy. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I have a question. For you. Sure. <laughs> um, do you know what they're? Will they be selling the compost then that they make from the stuff that we um, give them, um, or they, what's going to happen they, they, to it? They, they didn't say anything about that. They didn't say anything about that at all. So I guess they could make money off of it. Yeah, other places have done that, or so other places have, um, I think, given back bags of compost to, right. you know, the households that supplied the raw material. So maybe we'll see. Okay. Um, all right. What else did did Mr. Carter say on November seventh? Um, he said that DPW plans to conduct outreach to 44 entities, including 40 large grocery stores and four universities and colleges to inform them about their requirement to start composting that I told you that starts on January 1st, 2023. All this year, we thought, hey, maybe six months in advance, they would let um, universities and big grocery stores know, this is coming up guys, why don't you get prepared? Um, but no, they're going to, they will start reaching out at the beginning of next year is what he said. So it's obviously, you know, not going to happen uh, on January 1st, 2023. Um, we'll see how long it takes. Then he talked about um, the planned renovation of the Benning Road transfer station. And there, this was more encouraging. He said it would allow DC to process 100,000 tons of commercial organic waste and that it would be developed as a zero waste campus. So that's, that's encouraging. And then the other big things <clears throat> that he flagged were that DPW is going to establish a learning management platform for both home and commercial composters, included, including an EPA funded training program for commercial composters. And they're gonna develop toolkits on how to recycle properly. So 
all of those questions you were, or those points you were raising in the beginning about people dumping things in plastic bags, hopefully that will be clarified in these toolkits. It will, they'll have a toolkit on how to set out your leaves um, the right way. And he noted that commercially derived food scraps would comprise 14% of the district's entire waste stream. Um, then um, Blake Adams, who I think you invited to speak to tonight, said that um, they are planning on um, adding two new satellite food drop-off sites um, sometime next year, two. So in, if, you, if you had attended any of the sessions or looked, if you look at the draft framework, that, that draft framework paints a vision of compost um, bins being available at practically every bus stop and metro station in the city. That would be fantastic. We would love to see that, but, <clears throat> but their actual measures that they, they said that they committed, that they testified to and said they would do is to add two more drop-off sites. If you're not familiar, currently drop-off sites are usually located at farmer's markets. That means that they're opened one weekend day a week and many of those um, farmer's markets close in the colder um, winter weather. So not exactly easy uh, way to, to drop off. So that's what's on the horizon. Um, I know I'm being critical. I will admit that this marks progress um, in all of the uh, DPW oversight hearings that I've attended, council oversight hearings I've attended in the past couple of years. I've never really heard them talk about concrete measures like this before. Um, so that is, you know, that is a step in the right direction. But because they're not, you know, they're, they, they haven't spoken about all of the things that we would like, you know, we would like to see not just a, a pilot for curbside collection, but we would like to move to having that as part of the regular service. And we would like to see the compost drop-off sites um, be available like seven days a week. So Sierra Club has a petition about that. And I will, I will put um, the links in the chat later on. And it's, I, I think I put them on my last slide um, and I can send you the slides if you wanna distribute them to your, to your participants today. So, um, so that's what they did talk about, but they didn't talk about um, how they were gonna implement Save As You Throw, or they didn't talk about how they're going to embrace reusable foodware, and that's worrying. Um, the current um, framework also has no timelines um, or deadlines for implementation, but they explained that, that would that would be something that would be included in the um, the actual zero waste plan next spring. The district is also likely to have to pass new legislation and provide new funding for some of the measures. So they, you know, they may be not willing to commit to anything until they know what kind of legislation and funding they can actually achieve. Um, the Sierra Club would definitely like to see the district embrace reusable foodware, but that's going to require um, system changes, investments, and enforcement. And from my work in the National Reuse Network, I have seen that there are a growing number of small entrepreneurs across the country that provide reusable cups and takeout containers to restaurants and cafes. I don't know, have any of you ever seen one of these? Perhaps if you've traveled to the West Coast, the Boulder, New York City, Durham, North Carolina you can see um, companies doing this. And they, they provide the reusable containers to the restaurants. The, rest, the restaurants serve a customer in a reusable container or a cup. The customer more often than not puts a deposit on the container and the entrepreneurs use QR codes to track when one of their containers has been checked out. Then after the customer consumes their food or drink, they have to return the container either to the same restaurant or cafe or to a kiosk, could be located in the street or a building. 
Then the reuse um, entrepreneur picks up the dirties, washes them, sanitizes them, and delivers them back to the restaurants. So it's just like that milk bottle example I gave you at the beginning of my talk. And this appears to be the most um, viable alternative to single-use plastic and other single-use foodware. And I see that um, Lee has a question. So I actually have a comment. Um, so I, I am in Brooklyn, New York. This is where I'm Zooming from and where I live. And um, interestingly, um, a close friend of my daughter, who also lives in Brooklyn, has started a company called Deliver Zero, which is, are you, are, are you familiar with it, Susan? I don't know that particular company, but um, those are the kind of names that these companies tend to have. Right. So, right. so what they do is they provide reusable containers to the restaurants that are doing carryout. So when somebody orders a, del a carryout delivery or pickup, uh, the food is put in these containers and then the customer returns the uh, uh, container either to the restaurant or the next time they order a delivery, they give it to the delivery person. And it's actually becoming quite successful here in Brooklyn. And uh, it's, it's more work. But uh, for people who are interested in exactly these kinds of actions that you can take, uh, it is growing in the number of restaurants who are part of the, um, the network that they've established. And uh, so that's just an example of what you're, what you're talking about that is successful here up in New York City. That's, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, and I'm glad that, that one of you have, has seen this in action and it would be great to see that in action um, here in the district. A little bit of a, it is happening in DC. Um, another thing that was in the, the Zero Waste Act from 2020, um, and this was assigned to DOEE, was a small grants program so that restaurants and other entities could apply for grant funding to try out reusable foodware. So there are about 15 entities in DC that got that initial funding. Um, and uh, I saw one of them at Teaism, you know, the tea cafe mm -hmm. chain. Um, and they have, they got some funding and I guess they bought reusable teacups and customers treat that like a library card. They have to buy it for like $18. But then when they come back for their next cup of tea, they can either have it refilled in, in that cup or they can exchange it for a clean one. Um, it's up to the customers to decide. So that's that's one example that I've seen, but there are, there are many others. Paula, I have a I have a question. Um, yeah, what? A, well, let, let me ask it later. That's okay. I'm sorry. Okay, great. And I see that Lee's put in the chat um, a, a link to the article about um, uh, Deliver Zero, which is great. And so, could we find out where? Um, what is there a website where we could learn the name of those fifteen? places and then maybe frequent them? Yeah, that's a great idea. If you if you Google ditch the disposables, okay, okay. DC ditch the disposables, that's what the, the reusable foodware grant program is called. Mm -hmm. And the, the fiscal year 22 um, grantees are named there. And, and my recollection okay. is there are about 15 of them. And they are, they have launched, um, the grant program for fiscal year 23. So if you know of businesses that you'd like to encourage to apply for a grant, they have to apply for the grant, I believe before December 8th. Okay. Um, Judy? Um, yeah, uh, one, uh, I, I do think that um, there have been <clears throat> some advances, um, you know, outlawing styrofoam, um, is one and um, also plastic um, silverware. There are a lot of places now that are using bamboo or something else that at least um, is biodegradable. Um, and so, and, and there are things at our Go Green um, Bazaar um, table this weekend, we're gonna be selling, you know, the 
uh, you can get little packets of bamboo silverware so you never have to use their plastic ones. And they include straws um, also um, that you, I mean, you have to wash them and you have to keep them and carry them with you and remember to use them. But there are efforts um, to do that. Also, I have a collapsible cup I keep in my purse, it's lightweight. So I can use that instead of a plastic um, or a styrofoam cup someplace. So if, if you're serious about it, you can help in your small way, even though we know that we, we need to get uh, the, um, the retailers to, on board to do this. Yeah, that's right, Judy. Those are really good examples. And part of the Zero Waste Act of 2020 also set up a framework of serve on request. So currently, if you order food for takeout, you should not receive those things in your takeout order unless you request oh. them. Um, but we're hearing lots of examples of restaurants that are, are not complying with that. Um, and we did, one of the things that we did as volunteers, we worked with DOEE they had developed a great flyer to explain this to restaurants. And we went around, you know, pounding the pavement and handing out these flyers and explaining the new requirements um, to, give, to give them a heads up. And what DOE usually does is they use like the first six months of a new law going into effect to educate um, businesses. Um, they don't start finding them right away, but right now restaurants could be fined. Um, and I also, I think, um, I think Lee put the link to the Ditch the Disposables um, program in the chat, if you're looking into that. We also did a couple of webinars. So like in the height of the pandemic, when we weren't allowed to, to go out um, and talk to people, um, you know, face to face, we organized a number of, of webinars about this, this reusable foodware. So, um, so the framework that we have right now says that restaurants would only serve, would serve exclusively on either reusable foodware or compostable fiber foodware. Um, that would mean no more single use plastic foodware. That's fantastic. That's the world I wanna live in. But including a requirement without any municipal support for restaurants is unlikely to succeed at scale. So the Sierra Club proposed in our testimony um, about the, the, the framework that if the city is really gonna deploy all of these compost drop-off bins and recycling bins in public spaces, deploy some kiosks for people to return their reusable foodware as well. And We've also recommended that when they're thinking about their plans to develop transfer stations as zero waste hubs or campuses, I think is the term that um, Mr. Carter used, they could install a commercial wash facility there. So instead of everything have to be done by little entrepreneurs with very little economies of scale, there could be a municipal wash service. Um, but so far DPW hasn't responded to these recommendations that we've made. So we have no idea whether that will be included in the published zero waste DC plan this spring. Um, and that's now, um, and that's despite the fact that their consultants explained that they wanted to build the zero waste DC plan with input from, from residents. Um, in practically all of the sessions that we attended and in the Sierra Club, we tried to hit as many of those sessions as we could. We didn't hit, hit absolutely everyone, but we, we got to most of them. And we heard other people, not us, other people say that the zero waste plan should include a bottle bill. And of course the environmental community um, agrees but again, DPW has not responded with any sign that it would include a beverage container deposit program in the plan it's going to publish in spring. So why, why do we want a beverage container deposit program? So as I mentioned earlier, our projected residential plastic recycling rate for 2023 is less than 7%. But states that have bottle bills 
recover between 60 and 90% of their beverage containers, depending on the price of their deposit. States with a five cent deposit recover about 59%. States with a 15% deposit exceed 90%. So it works. But I have a question. Um, if, if there's such a small market for plastics, you're talking about plastic bottles as well as glass, yeah. Plastic, glass, and, um, and cans. So if there's so little market for the plastics now, um, where would people who collect these bottles, where would they take them? What would they do with them? So if they're clean, all right, and not contaminated like they frequently are when they get thrown in recycling bins. You know, they get dirtied by the other stuff that gets thrown in. Um, you know, the beauty of a bottle bill is the, that's pulled out from the, the recycling stream. And several states, I think every state on the West Coast has implemented post-consumer recycled content requirements so that um, bottles that are sold have to have X percent of recycled material in them. And that is starting to change the dynamic for the beverage industry that had been vehemently opposed to bottle bills in the past. Um, not that I am that hopeful that we won't get opposition, but um, there, there should be more of a market there. So um, go ahead, Judy. No, I was just going to say, <clears throat> Also, there are more um, entrepreneurs or very creative um, people who are figuring out ways to use that plastic. I have a pair of jeans that are made out of recycled plastic and, um, you know, decks and um, uh, chairs, um, outside chairs, they're using plastic too. So I think there will be more markets for, as you say, clean um, plastic when, when we recycle it. Right. Okay. Um, yes, and um, that's, that's true. That's true. Although um, probably reducing, you know, going back to that zero waste principle of reducing is probably um, a good thing to do with plastic. Lee, I see you have your hand up. Uh yeah, I'd like to make another comment. Uh, I, I feel like Brooklyn is really doing good stuff here. Um, what we have in our neighborhood is there are machines. They look like uh, vending machines. And there is a culture uh, among people who, when the recycling is put out, uh, who go and collect uh anything that can be put into these machines and uh they receive money for it so in some ways they're stealing from the city but um uh, ultimately though they're actually uh also going into sidewalk trash cans uh you know where they're picking separating out the um the recyclables and you see these people all over brooklyn uh, with shopping carts and huge amounts of recyclables. Uh, so I'm wondering, are there any places like that in DC? I don't remember seeing anything. No, so those are called reverse vending machines. Um, and does, does New York um, State have a, um, a deposit on their beverage? Yes. 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 So that's what, that they're, they're getting their deposits back. Um, they're getting deposits back on all those bottles. We don't have a beverage container deposit oh, log yet. And that's why um, we, you know, there's really no reason to have a reverse uh, machine, but that, that would be a really good thing to have um, once I'll be positive once we get our bottle bill. So uh, if we, if we do see what, what's going on in, in DC right now. So did you know that groups like the Anacostia river keepers, they do regular cleanups of all kinds of trash um, on and around the Anacostia River. They have found that 60% of the trash that they pick out of the river by weight is plastic bottles. 
Um, and empty plastic bottles don't really weigh very much. So that's a lot of bottles. And we've been teaming up with Anacostia River Keepers, Ward 8 Woods, um, at Friends of Anacostia Park, and we've been doing what's called a brand audit of the bottles, all the beverage containers, um, cans included, that are um, cleaned up um, at, these, at these cleanups. And we've audited, um, at the time we made this poster was 4,000, we're now up to 4,400 plastic and glass bottles and cans, trying to figure out who are the companies whose products are polluting our parks, waterways, and neighborhoods. And the top offenders are listed here on our polluter hall of fame. Um, so you can see the companies for all, all materials combined, glass, plastic, and cans are um, Nestle, um, Waters, North America, which has now sold its business to a company called Blue Triton, um, Pepsi, Coke, Anheuser-Busch, and Costco. And then if you look just at the plastic, it's everybody on this um, Polluter Hall of Fame poster except Anheuser-Busch, plus you add Costco, okay? So those, and, and those companies track in brand audits that are done nationally and worldwide as well. And states that have bottle bills have seen a dramatic decrease in the littering of beverage containers. And during the very first round of community engagement sessions back in August, um, we did attend wards five and seven um, and, and spoke to people who went to ward eight. And there the residents complained bitterly about litter and illegal trash dumping in their neighborhoods and parks. So we believe that they, they deserve a bottle bill as a matter of environmental justice. So that's why we have a second petition and I will provide these links in a bit, um, calling for measures that would reduce all this litter and trash dumping, such as a bottle bill and also having more water um, refill stations avail available for people so that they could use reusable water bottles. So what kind of actions could the League of Women Voters take on zero waste? I know that was one, something that Paula <clears throat> and Judy wanted me to talk about. So again, now's the time, or starting tomorrow, is the time to provide your written comments on the draft zero waste um, DC framework. Um, for round one, the comments had to be entered following the structure of the draft framework. And that was organized into seven goals and 53 actions were distributed amongst those seven goals. We don't know what they're going to publish tomorrow. So we'll, we'll have to see. Um, we'd also really appreciate your support on our compost and litter reduction um, petitions. And our plan is to reach out to a number of organizations and ask if they could share our petition with their networks. So please get back to me if that's something that you could do. Um, and let's see, let me just move here. Um, these are just um, the links to our two petitions. And then we have lots and lots of resources on our zero waste, zero waste um, web pages, including you should find the links to our our webinars on reusable foodware, if you're interested. Um, I would also suggest you could sign up for the residential curbside compost um, pilot if you live in a building of three or four units. And I would urge you to continue to watch development of the zero waste DC plan in the spring when it's published and follow which council member is going to take on oversight of DPW. Currently, council member Mary Che leads the council committee on transportation and the environment, but she will step down at the end of this year. Um, she'll be replaced by Matt Fruman, that we know, um, but that doesn't mean that Matt Fruman will take on this committee. And council chair <clears throat> Phil Mendelson has said that, you know, he's going to assign um, committees to council members uh, after the election. So, you know, that could happen any time, but he has not excluded reorganizing the committees. So the current transportation and environment committee um, could be split up um, or it might not necessarily have oversight of both DOEE and DPW. All of that could change. 
But once committee assignments are known, I would, I would also suggest following the budget hearings, which usually begin um, in the beginning of the new year. That will be key. Uh, council oversees and can revise the fiscal year 24 budget that the mayor um, and all of the departments propose. So will it, will it include funding for DPW to run the compost pilot for a full year? Will it include funding for DPW to do a save as you throw pilot? That's something that they um, should have been, should have done a long time ago. Um, will they provide funding for municipal support of reusable foodware for deployment of public recycling and compost bins and reusable foodware drop-off kiosks, at least in some public spaces? Um, it may be unrealistic to expect that there would be one at every single bus stop in the city, but um, at least some of them uh, could be equipped. So I hope this has given you background on this important but often ignored topic. I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. And thank you so much for inviting me to, to speak with you this evening. Thank you. That was wonderful, Susan. Um, I have a question about um, environmental justice. And it, it came up in one of the hearings of the environmental um, committee um, that Paula has been active um, on. What's the name of it, Paula? And the, Susan, the BC was, Climate Coalition, I think, is what right. you're talking about. And, mm -hmm. Right. And Susan was there, um, was a speaker, I believe. Um, but um, it, it, the question was about landfill and incinerator. Which of these two things is worse? Um, and 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 is anything being done about that in in the plan? Um, that's a really great question, um, Judy. So, if we went back to the the zero waste hierarchy, um, and if you looked at the um, Sierra Club's zero waste policy, um, it puts incinerators in kind of the no go zone. So, you know, landfills aren't great, but they're better than incinerators. And for the district. Um, DC keeps renewing contracts for our incinerator, which is located in Lorton, Virginia. And Lorton, Virginia, the population um, surrounding the incinerator is something like 55 to 60% black and brown peoples. So we're sending all of our waste there. Um, and that is very harmful for those people from the, you know, from in terms of the air pollution and things that leach into the into the water. Um, so the environmental community in DC has been urging the district to not renew that contract again. And I thought I heard some rumblings that that might be the direction that we were going to take, but I will believe it when I see it. Well, so what would we do though? Would we just get another um, incinerator? No, we would we would send more things to landfills. I see. But you know, the goal is not to send more stuff to landfills. Right. The stuff, the the goal, you know, is to reduce <laughs> and reuse and and recycle instead of sending things to landfills. Go to thrift stores. Exactly. <laughs> I think Jane's got her hand up. Hi, I was the person who called in who had the background noise. I was shuttling my kids to activities. <laughs> um, so speaking of, of kids, this is an issue since relocating here from Santa Monica, California. It's an issue I've been involved with to uh, with my my children, my boys, and they care deeply about waste and waste diversion and um, waste reduction and we did um, give comments at the last round. Uh, my son was the youngest, uh, eight-year-old gave his comments. And, I, think, uh, I think we were in the same session. Oh, uh, hi, yeah, it was, it was, it was really good. Um, <clears throat> but we, I just am seeking, we'll fill out um, the petition, Maybe we'll pick up waste, but are there any advocacy opportunities for children? Because it's really 
passionately disturbing some kids that um, adults can't get their act together to make enforceable laws because all the well-intentioned individuals isn't gonna it's good isn't gonna do it we need a law and we need it yesterday that you have to put your organic waste in the green bin and et cetera et cetera um there's obviously there's i don't think there's anything preventing your ch your children um uh, I don't remember how old they are, but if they, you know, if they can write, they they can probably submit written comments. Um, I I could, I mean, this is just an idea. This is not like the Sierra Club saying this. This is me speaking in my personal capacity. Um, I think it would be really powerful if if children sent drawings um, to the mayor uh, to let her know how important this issue is uh, to them and. It would be great to see that, I mean, you know, from your family, but it would be great to see that on a larger scale. If that's something that maybe you could organize in your, mm -hmm. in, in your child or your children's school. Yeah, I'll keep all, good, thank you. And I'll, yeah. I'll keep looking also, if, there's no Sierra Club kid chapter, right? No. And yeah, that's you know Roots and Shoots, Jane Goodall's. Keep looking for a roots and shoots chapter for them to join because you know they're some of them facing quite an existential environmental kind of crisis and they, they are. are I want to focus them on something positive to affect change. Okay, well, thanks for those ideas. Okay, I see Sarah has her hand up and hasn't spoken before. Go ahead. Yes, Sarah. and maybe this is really totally off the plate. We shouldn't even be talking about it here. I know very, very little about composting, and I hear you talking about having sort of public compost things. Um, I live in a high rise um, retirement community right downtown. We have a large problem with rats in this neighborhood. And I'm sort of looking at the intersection between these two problems. Uh, if we have, I mean, am I way off base here in thinking that compost uh, facility or this places where people leave compost in a public place is going to sort of attract more rats. I, 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 I maybe that's totally off base here, but it's it's a concern for our community. Uh, and I mean, so, for instance, the rats ate the wiring in our in the oh. in the bus that we used, and so we had to move it and park it in a, an offsite place, which is incurred some expense and whatnot. It, no, it's a it's a common concern. So you're definitely not um, off track there. Um, so what we're talking about is having locations that people could drop off their food scraps, and they would be taken to some other place to actually be composted. We're not talking about trying to compost in the middle of a, a densely urban area. Um, mm -hmm. The district does have, and it's, I think it's the Department of Parks and Recreation, they do have a set of community gardens that do provide some compost facilities, and those could be interspersed throughout the, the city, um, but probably not downtown um, where, where you're talking about. But also, if you think about it, right now, all of our food scraps are going into our garbage cans. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't really change that. Um, that equation at all. And if the and if there were these public drop-off sites and they were taken away quickly, then there should be less infest, infestation. And I'm wondering, Jane, whether you you've you know you joined or you moved here from California, and California already has curbside compost pickup. So what's the experience um, been there? It's so easy and fantastic. So first of all, the green bin is like a green bin. You put your yard waste in there. And so it was easy to integrate then the food scraps into your already existing green bin that is for your grass clippings or little things from your yard. And then you can just add your food scraps into it. And then the truck takes it away like it takes away your trash and you're recycling. It is so easy and it's the law and 
I, I mean, it's the future and it's happening in DC will be just fine. So I hope they, I hope they jump on board because um, a bright well, future. The secret is if to everything we've talked about is the implementation, obviously. And I mean, somebody actually doing it on time. Isn't, isn't, isn't that a huge factor? Agreed. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe I should turn it back to, to Paula and Judy to, to moderate. Um, I see there's a, a question from Erica as well as Judy. Erica, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, I wanted to kind of talk more broadly about DC as a destination um, for people who often are here temporarily or on vacation or that kind of thing. How do we get people from outside of the city to feel invested in these kinds of efforts. Um, I feel like some people would kind of roll their eyes or see it as like an East Coast elitist kind of thing or, you know, like hippy dippy ideas. So I, I'm just intrigued about like some of the discourse or the framing that could be successful on getting people excited, even if it's not, you know, near and dear to their hearts like it is for DC residents. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I mean, it's not something that I have to confess I haven't given a lot of thought to. I've been thinking more about um, for for DC residents as a as a priority. Um, but I think you know it underlies the need for education and outreach um, for everybody, both for district residents and for our visitors when they come. And it is possible to do that. And you know. The district's going to have to be creative about that. I can tell you an experience that I had living abroad. Um, I lived in Switzerland and in the Geneva airport had these fabulous videos. They, they set up, um, you know, waste collection sites where you had multiple choices, things, you know, things that you were recycling. I can't remember whether there was compost and trash. And they just had a continuous video going on showing you what went where. Um, so it's not that hard to develop. How you get people invested um, is a different issue. And I have to confess, I, I'm, I'm afraid I haven't thought about it, but I'd love to hear your ideas if you have any. It's something I struggled with uh, a lot in some of my previous research and just discussions with family, right? Like I, I have a lot of people who still burn their trash in my family. So it's it's something to think about, but I, I was hoping, you know, someone on this call might be more experienced. Um, shower it's, thinking, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. It just seems like the young people are the ones who, you know, on social media and such, need to be talking about this. We need to tell every young person we know, but we can all talk it up with our neighbors and, and friends. And, you know, um, I mean, I just think it's such an important issue and it's something we can do. We can easily, each and every one of us can take action to, you know, to work towards zero waste. We can do that. I take my, you know, my compost down to the farmer's market every Sunday, but that's relatively minor, but there's all kinds of other things we can do. Um, and I think Judy and I are gonna keep working on this because we both feel <laughs> passionate about it. And we are wanting to partner with the Sierra Club if we can, I don't know. And, um, and we look to um, other members of the league to join us on our climate task force. I do have one other name and, um, so, uh, you know, and, and I just want to say before we close that this has been fantastic, uh, Susan. We really learned a lot and um, I took copious notes and I'm going to study them and try to follow up with other actions. So thank you so much for coming and speaking to us tonight. It's been, um, it's, it's been my pleasure. And if I, if I could just say one more thing to Erica, Last summer, the Smithsonian, um, you know, had their, I can't remember whether it's folk life or folklore festival, um, but we did um, have a stand down there to talk about sustainable living and had some examples of zero waste products and practices. And we had a, 
amazing interaction um, with people who were both visitors um, to DC as well as, as residents or people from neighboring um, municipalities. So that is one way that we could, could reach out to our visitors. And I wasn't sure whether Judy still had her hand up. Ah, uh, she does. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was for Jane, um, but I don't see her on here. I don't know if you're still there, but um, about the children because Moms Clean Air Force is a wonderful organization that does um, bring children to Congress <laughs> um, to testify and to advocate for clean air and clean clean earth. So I would recommend them um, as one place that your children um, might get involved. It's a great idea, get the kids involved. And, and another thing for us individually, it's hard to do, and I embarrass my husband a lot when we go someplace and I go to the, to the manager and, and when we're leaving and paying our bill, um, but telling them, um, do you know that um, by, <laughs> that, and this was when we're traveling because all places don't have um, laws against using styrofoam, but I was out in New Mexico and, and it was a nice restaurant and a very popular one, but they used styrofoam um, for all of their, and there are a lot of states like that and a lot of areas within states. Um, and I know it's expensive um, to use things that are biodegradable, but I think for all of us who feel strongly about this, we've got to get up our courage and tell them um, in a polite way <laughs> that um, for benefit of our grandchildren and great grandchildren, um, please think about um, doing away with um, plastic, single-use plastic and um, styrofoam containers because styrofoam never biodegrades and plastic takes a long time. And I have to say, it's not just, you know, affecting us because I, I remember walking on an island, we were kayaking in Fiji oh. and away from the village where we were staying, we got to the other side and there were literally, there was a, there were hills and mountains of plastic mm -hmm. bottles. That's where it all ends up. It ends up in these, you know, poorer countries that are struggling with other issues too. And, and it's, it's just, it's, it's horrible. So if you've ever seen that, you'll never forget it. Don't buy, don't buy water <laughs> in <laughs> bottles. And when I see people buying these great cartons of water bottles in bottles, I almost, you know, I wonder, should I go up and say, you know, you could use water from the tap. Well. Paula, are you closing us or? Um, I Kathy? guess um, we're done. I uh, I don't know if Kathy has any final word or if we should just say um, thank you again and thanks to everyone who came. Mm -hmm. And we are going to continue this work. So um, we welcome anyone else to join us. Just let us know. Thanks, Susan. You will and we'll be in touch with you, Susan, I'm sure. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. And thanks for such a, a lively and engaging uh, conversation. It's great um, <laughs> to see everybody so, so passionate about this issue. And, and I look forward to hearing back from you on your ideas of, of ways that we could partner. That would be fantastic. Great. OK. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. Yes, bye-bye now. Bye. Thank Night you, everyone. everybody. Mm -hmm.